If you will, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3 this morning. First Corinthians chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Sound like at least one person is excited about the preaching. Huh? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. When you find that, if you'll stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, and errant, His preserved word. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and, you, and, not, and not with meat. For hitherto... For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Verse 3, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and are you not carnal? Verse 5, For who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive of his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth their own. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For of the foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's works of what sort it is. If any man's works abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive, y'all say that with me, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Father, in the name of Jesus, God help us, Holy Ghost. We acknowledge you, Lord. Uh, we acknowledge our need. We acknowledge that you are fine. Well, you are infinite, and we are finite. We need help. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I come to you this morning, I come with a, a, a thought and a title this morning. If I were to entitle a sermon, I call it "Investing in, in a Reward." Investing in a reward. Now, I'm sure all of y'all want to invest in some money market accounts and some. 401k and some 457, those are investing terms that we know, right? And I hope 
that you do invest some stuff. And I hope you make a million dollars. In fact, I hope you make a billion dollars. And I hope you come back to Global Baptist Church and you say, Lord, thank you for that billion. I'm going to give my tenth and I'm going to lay it right here to Global Baptist Church. Boy, I do. I really do. I hope you have a great retirement and I hope that we make lots of money and I hope that we give lots of money as well. I think it would be foolish to say that God's people ought to be poor. But we need to make good investment decisions in life financially. We need to look after our children. We need to look after our wives, uh, husbands, or look after wives and prepare for a time of death that hopefully they will, you know they're going to live longer than us because they agitated us so much. We're going to go, oh my goodness, right there, say amen. Wives say get a life, elbow them and say get a life insurance policy and invest in me. But when we think about investments, many times we've got to think about it from the spiritual aspect as well. We get from God what we put into this thing. Even in building churches and growing churches and growing as a congregation, we're only going to receive what we have invested in. Now, it's one thing to get on the altar and pray for God to do mighty things, and He can, and we must be adamant about prayer. But we have got to be adamant about investing into the community if the community is to come here and to uh, be blessed by the ministry. Uh, We've got to invest, and when we think about investment, I think probably sometimes the hardest thing to invest in is into our spiritual walk. Why? Because we can talk to investors, they advise us, and we can give money, and we can see a projected plan, can't we? And we feel like we can achieve that plan. But with God, many times, it's not as clear and objective as exactly what's going to happen at the end of the term. You see, some investment we won't ever see until many years after death. Y'all have seen and heard the testimony of how uh, works of uh, past generations helped us to get this building and there was relationships that were made that was a blessing here. There are people that are still getting rewards after death. Uh, So it's not as easy and many times a step in faith for spiritual reward one day is harder for us to grasp hold of in it because we want security and we want certainty of what we're going to get. Can I just tell you, sometimes stepping out for God ain't so certain. When we stepped out to start this church, boy, it was a scary thing because I'm not charismatic. I'm not an excited person, exciting person to even start a church. This ain't me personality-wise. I was stepping out into a crocodile-infested Nile River But God has provided, but he only provided after the step was taken. I think about a quote that Adrian Rogers spoke one time. Adrian said this, he said, You may ask yourself, what if it costs me? Speaking of serving God, what if it costs me? Well, when Noah drove that last nail in the ark, he may have had nothing left, but when he came out of that ark, he had inherited the earth. Friend, I want you to understand that God told Noah to build a boat and Noah was faithful with what he had. Do you understand that in today's uh, today's, uh, money that it would have took millions to have built that boat in that day and time? Do you understand that it wasn't just him and himself, but he would have had to hire all kinds of servants to come and build that boat? And can I tell you, what would it have cost to bring all of that nice gopher wood and all of that wood into the desert where there is no trees? There would have been great expense in this. And no doubt when he drove that last nail, or maybe you want to be a man of certain maybe that last wood peg in that day and time when he drove that last one if he had spent everything that he had saved up was it worth it? Well you'd probably have to ask Noah after the flood than before it because no doubt he was like us when he had drove that last peg he was probably standing there saying Lord you said you would when are you going to do it? No doubt there was fear and there was worry because he was human just like you and I and investing something especially of ourselves and uh, sacrificing deeply for God, maybe stepping out of the workplace in the full-time ministry or stepping into some place that God has called you can be very scary. But friend, I want you to understand it's always rewarding and God always pays the best dividends to those who invest in him. 
We look this morning thinking about that and, and, and investing in a reward. We look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through, 1 through 15. What is going on here is the Corinthian church was a wicked church. It was, uh, it was in Corinth, which was a Roman city, and Corinth was a metropolitan area, so there was a lot of cross-travel from all over the world that would commute there and then go out on ships. There was a lot of, of shipping that took place, so it was a, a, a metropolitan, and there was a fake false god temple up on the, on the hill, and there there were uh, uh, false god worship, and they would worship through sexual relations with prostitutes. Well, they were temple prostitutes, right? Man can condone anything in his life if he wants to, but there was great wickedness, and here these people were being saved out of wicked lifestyles, and they were coming together now, and Paul was having to teach them how to live holy and righteous like God. Of course, they had a lot of baggage and they were bringing that baggage into the church and Paul was working through that and these were building, they were saying, I'm of Apollos and I'm of Paul and I'm of this one because they were thinking that associating with a certain preacher was going to give them a greater reward for God and with God. But friend, here Paul begins to talk to them and say, listen, let me teach you really how this thing works biblically. Investing in a reward. If you're going to invest in a reward, there's some things you need to understand that these Corinthians needed to understand. And Paul said, first of all, that investing carnality will not produce reward. Investing carnality will not produce reward. Verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Verse 2, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able to to bear it. They were investing carnality. Paul came and he began to give a spiritual word and began to try to teach in the spirit and the people couldn't receive it. Rather than standing up as mighty Bereans who were studying in the scriptures and able to rationalize and talk the scriptures, he had to sit them down crisscross applesauce and say, look here, the great sea parted and the red sea parted. We had to, he was having to treat grown adults as if they were toddlers. And friend, I want you to understand that Christian carnality will not be rewarded by God. We should be growing and, and we should be developing in our faith. And we should today be more grounded in God's word than we were when we were saved out of sinfulness. There's the expectation that Paul had that you as Christians should be growing and maturing. Many times we get tired, don't we? Many times we want to give up. Many times we, we teach Sunday school consistently for a year or two years and we get tired and wore out and we think if we just lay back for a while and quit for a while. But friend, I want you to understand that what you need not is not quit. You just need to rest a little bit sometimes. See, this isn't something that we quit but we continue to advance and progress in our Christian walk and grow closer to God. And friend, many times people bring carnality and carnality will not produce reward. The Corinthians were an immature people as you see in verse 1 and 2. They were immature in the faith. He was feeding them like a baby. Back there drinking her bottle. Wasn't that a good illustration this morning? She's chomping down on that milk. And what would y'all look like if I just broke out some bottles this morning and gave all y'all a bottle and y'all were up there just drinking on your bottles of milk this morning? Uh, it wouldn't look very mature, would it? And that's what Paul said that these look like. He said, I can't bring good meat to you because you're still on the milk. Carnality will, ne will never produce reward. Not only were they immature in the faith, but also in verse 3 and 4, they were divided amongst themselves. Verse 3 and 4, For ye are, not, are ye not yet carnal? For whereas, verse 3, there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not yet carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I'm of Apollos, Paul, Apollos, Paul, and another Apollos, uh, are you not yet carnal? What? There was division among them. Friend, you want to know a church that's not going anywhere, that's not, that's not uh, positively moving forward, it's one that's fussing among the congregation. This side against that side, or that one against this one, and there's a lot of division and carnality and fussing. I've been there. And I've been in some churches, and there, I've pastored some churches, and some of those churches... Uh, from way back when, are still in the same shape today. I can talk to preachers that go in, they'll talk to me a little bit, and you know what? They've got the same carnality that they had 15 years ago when I pastored them. 
They've not advanced, they've not moved forward, and they will not move forward until they move past the vision and some of the ungodly acts that are going on. We see here that they were divided. They were divided because they were saying, I'm a Paul. Paul was a great preacher. Boy, I'm telling you what, he'd hammered down. You'd see Paul and he'd have a black eye and a broke arm in a sling and, and crip lipping around and say, Paul, Paul, what happened to you? Oh, I've just been in revival down at Corinth. Just uh, got a few souls saved because he was a roughneck and he'd go into hard places and preach hard. And then Apollos was a great orator. Uh, he was a great speaker. He was polished. He was much like I am not. He was polished and just said the right words. And they were associating with different personalities and thinking that that was going to give them greater reward. They were divided among themselves and carnality will not produce reward with God. Secondly, uh, investing uh, unity will produce reward. Investing unity will produce reward. Uh, uh, We see it in verse 5. Look at verse 5 with me. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believe? Even as the Lord gave to every man. Paul and Paulus, it's not that they're lack of importance, but it says, what are they? They're not gods to be worshipped or identified with, but they are simply the servants of God who came and won you. What did he say, verse 6? He's talking about the unity of all working together. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. He's speaking about the unity of our mission to work and our ministry and to work for God, that we would all work together for, to accomplish the same goal of Christ being lifted up. Verse 7, so then neither is he that planteth anything and neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. We're working together to grow. He uses an agriculture illustration here for their day. He said somebody came by and plowed the field. Somebody came and planted the seed. When the seed came up, somebody came by and watered it. Uh, While we're there, I would like for somebody to go back there and water those Christmas uh, uh, holly bushes or uh, poinsettias that's back there because somebody planted them, somebody grew them, but somebody ain't been watering them because they back there and they like this right here and about dead. Uh, anything my, well, I'm going to leave that alone. Anything, anyway, well, anyway, you got to take care of a plant and somebody ain't doing their job. We either go to the dump with them or if somebody is uh, feeling, uh, you know, like you need to save something, it might be a good time to go get them plants because they look pretty bad, okay? We look and we see here that what's happening, that he's talking about the unity of the ministry, that we're all working together, quit with the division, because unity will bring reward where uh, diversity or division will not. So we see that and we think about unity producing reward. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because Paul uh, speaks in 12, he speaks of this. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many members. If the foot shall say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, uh, where uh, were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? Paul uses the analogy that we as Christians should not be divided because we all have different spiritual gifts. We all have different spiritual gifts to bring to the table. Uh, Now, uh, some of y'all are good at construction work, and y'all have been great for doing some of the construction work around here. I have learned that some people do not have the spiritual gift of painting. Yep, we've had other people from other churches come here, and they'd be trash all in the paint and stuff. They were good, but they weren't the best painters. We all have gifts. Some can preach, some can't preach. Some can sing, some can't sing. If you can't sing, don't try to sing. Say amen right there. I've seen people that tried to sing that couldn't sing that sure tortured everybody, but everybody had to lie in the, lie in the congregation and say, oh, that was good, right? But what he's saying, he's saying that we're all one body and some are hands and some are feet and some are legs and some are eyes and some are ears and we need all to, to actually produce something. And friend, I want to tell you today that what Paul is saying, that unity will produce reward. 
We see, first of all, carnality will not produce reward. Secondly, unity will produce reward. But thirdly, in verse 8, the latter part, I want you to see that reward will be individually given. Reward will be individually given. Look at verse 8. He says in the last part of verse 8, uh, he says, And every man shall receive his, what? Own reward according to his own labor. Well, what he's saying is now he has told them, he said, now listen, we're all in this thing together. Don't be choosing Paul and don't be choosing Apollos. Don't cause division. We're all in this thing together. We're all working for a common goal and uh, we are all working uh, to produce something together. We all have a common purpose, but we don't, won't all have a common reward. Because your rewards will not come as a corporate body, but your rewards will be individually given. So what he's saying is that by associating with Paul or associating with Paulus does not mean that you're going to have a bigger reward just because Paul's got a bigger following or that Apollos has a bigger following. You will not have a greater reward just because you were Baptist or because you were Pentecostal because some, one group was bigger than the other. Oh, no. You're working for a common goal, but you are going to be individually rewarded by what you have done by your merits, not by someone else's merits. And that's what he's showing us here in verse 8. He is showing us uh, in verse 8, he's teaching us uh, that uh, we are united in purpose, but we are individually uh, going to be rewarded. Verse 8, read it again. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. See the, the, the united purpose? And then, and everyone shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We see individual reward. And after he shows us this, this individual reward, let's speak about, he speaks about reward that we're going to receive individually in verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11, we see that reward will be given according to God's judgment of our works. Reward is going to be according to God's judgment of our works. God is going to examine our works. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. That is an agriculture term. It means you're God's field. He's plowing you. He's planting you. He is watering the field and taking care of the field. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, a wise master builder, I'm building, I'm a master builder, I have laid a foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is in Christ Jesus. Probably most likely uh, the leaders and preachers are being spoken to here when he's talking about this. But what he's saying, Paul is saying, we're all working together, but we need to individually be careful how we're building on this same structure. Paul said, I laid a foundation. Others are building the walls. Others are going to put on a roof. Others are going to shingle. Some are going to put into windows and some are going to put on the outer furnishings of the house. But let everybody that's building on this same thing, Christ Jesus, let him be careful how he builds because you don't want to get the wrong siding or the wrong color on the wrong house. We are going to be examined. God is looking and God is examining and is cautioning these to be careful how you're building because you Corinthians, right now, you're carnal. Can't even feed you the word because you're carnal. And now you've got all of these divisions and arguments over things that are not even spiritual arguments. You're not being rewarded because you're not even building on the right foundation. You're making a mess out of the house is what he's kind of getting to here as he speaks to them. Remember now, we're talking about reward will be individually given. Uh, reward will be given according to God's judgment in verses 9 through 11. He's going to examine our uh, works, and our works must be in Christ Jesus. Now, I think our welfare system is, is a good thing to some degree. It is manipulated and misused in a lot of ways. But there are a lot of social workers who are, who, who are doing a good deed. But friend, I want you to understand that just being a social worker for the government is not the same as building on Jesus Christ. The, the person that has the canned food delivery on, in the church is doing works for Jesus Christ and trying to get the gospel in. The social worker, for the most part, is making a paycheck to take care of Uncle Sam's business. We're taking care of God's business. We're going to be rewarded for what we have done for Jesus Christ, not what we have done ultimately just in the natural realm of our living. 
Uh, we see here not only that uh, God is judging our works, but God will judge between our good and our bad works. Verse 12, God is going to judge between our good and our bad works. Verse 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. What do we see? We see good uh, works and we see wicked works here. Uh, what are good works? Gold, silver, precious stones. Those are things that last. Uh, I've seen recently on Facebook, I've seen uh, where they had dug into some of the, uh, the tombs of the Egyptians and they found some of the oldest gold that they've ever found that was thousands of years old. It's not more than 6,000 years old because we believe in a young earth theory, right? But nonetheless, I'll just throw that in for no reason, but uh, uh, just to, to put that in there. We don't believe in eons of time and billions of years. We understand scripturally that the world is roughly 6,000 years old and that 7,000th year is when Christ is going to come in and rule for a thousand years, seven. God's completion number of completion. But nonetheless, what we see is they said, that, man, it lasted this long and it still looked good. It was fine gold, good bracelets, good earrings, nice. Friend, gold and silver and stones last. They are things that preserve well and your good works will be preserved. They are precious metals that will last for a long time. But what does wood, hay, and stubble do? It don't last long, do it? It rots down, it deteriorates. And friend, good works are works that are done for Jesus Christ and they're going to last for eternity, but those things that are just done are not going to last very long. You see, the sad thing is, is that we can come to the house of God uh, even on a regular basis and come just to be here and that be wood, hay, and stubble. But to those who are praying and serving and doing it like they should are receiving precious reward from the Lord Jesus Christ. We see him that there are good and there are bad works. Not only that, we see that the works, how are you going to examine what is hay and what is precious gold? How are you going to examine that? The Bible says in the next verse, verse 13 and 14, every man's work shall be made manifest. Manifest means it's going to be revealed, whether it's hay or whether it's gold. For the day will declare it. What day? He's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. That is the judgment when believers will go and stand before God. Some call it the Bema judgment. That's a old uh, Greco-Roman word, Bema, which means after an event, you stand up on the boxes, and the taller box is the one that won. First place is way up here. Second's here. Third is down here on the boxes. And what it was, it was a time that uh, you would sit before the king, and he would give reward of your great athletic event. And that's what our our Christian service is going to be one day we'll stand before God and we'll stand before God and he will examine to see what kind of reward we really did for him past motives and past what we said we were doing God's going to look inside and say well you got gold here but you got hay and stubble here so it's going to be judged by fire verse uh, 13 by fire and they shall try every man's works of what sort it is verse 14 if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive reward what is it saying? It's talking about fire. What is this fire? We could see uh, in the scriptures in Jeremiah uh, chapter 20 uh, and verse 9. I'll read that to you very quickly. Jeremiah 20 uh, verse um, 9 says this. Uh, then I said, I will not make mention, uh, but his word was in my heart. His word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearance, and I could not stay. We could prove from many more scriptures that the word of God is many times illustrated as a fire, as a consuming fire. So when he's talking about we're going to be judged by fire, he's talking about the judgment of those who were saved, not the judgment of those who were lost. The saved will be judged for reward, the loss will be judged for sin. I'm thankful this morning I'm saved. I ain't got to an answer for my sins because Jesus Christ took every one that was and is and will be on the cross at Calvary. My sins are done away with. I am perfect in Jesus Christ this morning, not because I'm perfect, but in God's eyes, the penalty's been paid. And he says, boy, when I see Kyle, I see perfection. I wish my wife looked at me like God did, don't y'all? 
Boy, we look and we see and understand that God's going to judge us. He's going to judge us by fire. The word of God is considered a fire. So when we're judged, our works are going to come by a consuming fire. So say this is a fire and our works are coming by and that fire is burning over those works. What comes through the fire on the other side? Wood, hay, and stubble is going to do what? It's going to burn up and deteriorate and not make it to the other side. But the gold and the precious stone and the the, the metals are going to come through and they're going to make it to the other side. And that that makes it to the other side, God's going to say, that was real, true, good service and I'm going to reward it. But what does fire do also to gold and to silver and the precious stones? Fire purifies those things. It burns the infirmities off. So the infirmities of our labor for God are going to be burned away and those pure, clean works for God are going to be something that we invested on this side and we're going to receive returns on the other side. And just as Noah drew that last nail in the boat, when he come on the other side, what did he have? He had inherited all of the earth. We look and we see, thinking about investing in a reward. Uh, We've seen that investing carnality will not produce reward. Secondly, we saw unity will produce reward. Thirdly, reward will be individually given. But lastly, this morning, wrong investment will not be rewarded. Wrong investment will not be rewarded. Look at verse 15 with me. If any man's work shall be burned... In other words, burn and not make it through the fire. He shall suffer loss, but himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If any man's works are burned, the things that he did he thought were for God, but when they came through they were burnt up, wood, hay, and stubble, and then he's empty-handed up here before God. He's going to suffer loss. It doesn't mean that he's going to hell, the suffering loss, because he's saved. The reason that he's being tested at this judgment seat of Christ is because he was saved. This is a reward for works, not a reward for sin, because sin was dealt with at Calvary for those that were saved. So he'll suffer loss, but friend, what is it saying? He'll stand before God, the one one day that he loved so good and that he worked and achieved so much for, and the sorrow that will come not having done anything for the Lord. Friend, if we could keep, if I could keep this on a daily attitude that one day I'm going to be sorrowful before God because many of my opportunity was failed because I had lived worldly or I had done things just to do them rather than to do them for God. Friend, one day the investment to the spiritual is going to matter and the investment to the rest of the world ain't going to make one hill of beans to us. Go talk to some of those that are laying in a hospital bed this morning that are gasping for breath, that are fixing to meet their maker. And ask them if they wish they'd have worked another overtime hour at work. Ask them if they had worked quite so efficiently to try to get 30 more cent on their evaluation at the end of the year. Ask them those questions and see if they say, boy, I'll tell you what, I wish I'd have went on that storm break and made that other thousand dollars 20 years ago. Never heard that before. But they've always been pleased with their service for God or are the sorrowful that they have wasted so much time now that they're fixing to see and be evaluated and to be judged. Many, it says, will suffer loss. Wrong investment will not be rewarded. Wrong investment will not be rewarded. You've got to be investing in Jesus Christ and surrender to Him. I think about some wrong investment. And I think about Jonah. Do you remember Jonah in the Old Testament? Jonah went down and to Tarshish. He was told to, to go and preach the gospel, uh, preach the word to, um, uh, to Nineveh. And he said, no, I ain't going because I hate them Ninevehs. I don't even want them to be saved. That's a bad attitude, wasn't it? You think that was wood, hay, and stubble or gold? That was wood, hay, and stubble. That was Ori County redneck stubborninity, if that's a word. And he ran from God. We remember that God prepared a great wind, a great fish, and then he prepared a great revival through Jonah. But he had to get Jonah's attitude and his mind geared on his will for him. And Jonah had a bad attitude. And even at the end of the revival, revival, he wasn't a good Baptist preacher because he was upset because people was getting saved. 
chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says of Jonah, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Why? Because they, got, they, were, they were turning to God. Verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and great of kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. What did he say? God, I knew you were a good God. That's why I ran down and wouldn't come preach the gospel to these people because I hate these Assyrians because they have been so wicked and mean to my people. And he didn't want them saved. And he, anyway, he still went down and did what God said, but he did it with an anger and a wrath. He kicked over the cans and said, God will save you if you want him. And they did. And they got saved. And he was having a little pity party here. He gets on the side of a hill and, and, and it's hot and he uh, put, gets under a gourd and he shades for a little bit and he's mad at God. Then in Jonah chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, And God said unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death, God. I'm mad with you. Verse 10, Then he said, Lord, thou hast had pity on the gourd for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in that. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Friend, I can't answer for God, and I can't particularly say in this case, but I can tell you, Jonah's works in this specific case look a little bit like wood, hay, and stubble to me. And I think that's the same time, that same way that we can be found many times serving God with the wrong attitude. And what we need to understand is that wrong investment will not be rewarded. I think, and I, I think it's a good thing to take care of your family and provide for them. I do think God will reward us for that one day to provide for them financially, to make sure they have a roof over their head. But friend, I want you to understand, I, I'd rather them live in a cardboard box on the alley of a rough, rough alley, uh, petting alley cats all day and all night, than to deny them the spiritual knowledge, revelation of God, and to teach them to spirit, make a spiritual investment in my children and in my family. If I miss that, I've missed everything. And wrong investment will not be rewarded. <clears throat> I think about what Warren Wisby said in closing. You know, a lot of times I think we're just scared to make investments in God. The flesh is scared. I, I could tell you that if the Lord were to, uh, to pull me quickly out of, uh, out of the workplace where I got a lot of plans and hopefully retirement one day and pull me out of something like that and throw me into some type of, that would be a scary thing. That's just something that I'm thinking about in the illustration this morning. What would it be for you for God to ask a great sacrifice of you this morning? For some, it would be salvation to lead their sinful life and to come unto God and leave that behind. That would be a great task for some people just to receive salvation. Would they drive the last nail like Noah or would they keep the nail in their pocket for another day? The thing about it is that a lot of times we fail to invest because we're scared we won't receive a return. We're scared that we might lose some type of security on this side. But friend, can I tell you that just like Noah, put everything you've got in God and God will give the dividends and the security that you need. When we look very quickly, when we look at Noah's account, yes, the ark is being in Christ Jesus, sealed till the day of redemption. That is the picture that Jesus is a type that is pictured in the ark. Those that are in Christ Jesus will surpass and survive the judgment of God, the watery judgment. One day this fiery judgment will surpass it because we'll be in Christ Jesus and there'll be a fireproof ark rather than a waterproof ark. Say amen right there. But also in this, when I heard Rogers' statement, it brought me and it brought something, an idea to me that I think is true, that not only do we see that in Christ Jesus it surpasses the judgment of God uh, as it did with Noah, the watery judgment, but also the works that are done in Christ Jesus will surpass and come to the other side of God's judgment. Noah put into this ark, he invested in this ark, he worked. Friend, I want you to understand what a picture we have there that everything that we do in and 
and for Jesus Christ are not going to perish in the flood of God's judgment, but they will be there with us on the other side and be rewarded. Can I tell you, God be the best investment that you could decide to make this morning in life. Warren Wiersbe said this, thinking of being scared to step out into God's will for your life. God's will will never lead you where God's grace cannot keep you and God's power will not use you. Every head, every bow, I closed as we come this morning. Ask the musicians to come and prepare to play softly. We come to a decision time this morning. We've heard the word. We've been challenged by the word. No doubt the Holy Spirit speaks. He speaks to believers and he also speaks to those who are unbelievers. And this morning, no doubt, a, a message uh, like this is challenging to us all. It's challenging to me myself. Friend, this morning is your opportunity to make a decision. You've been putting things off for a long time. You've said, I'll do it later. I'll get it later. I'll do that later. And you keep putting it off. And if you put it off this morning, you know what? You'll be the same shape months from now because you didn't come and yield to God. This altar is open this morning for those who maybe need to come talk to God. Maybe you need to get some things right, some things cleaned up with God. Maybe this morning you need to just come down to God. Talk to your accountant for a little while. And ask him how you need to be investing spiritually for him. Maybe you've been struggling. Maybe the devil's been on you. Maybe you've been wearied by God calling you to step in some type of ministry or to some type of work for him. And you've been scared to make that final step. Friend, can I tell you this morning that this morning would be a good time just to go ahead and come down to this altar and say, God, what would you have me do? I yield myself to you. Lord, whatever it is, I give it to you, Lord. Lord, I take my last nail and I put it in your boat. Lord, I want my works to be for you and not for this world. Maybe you're here and you've never been saved by the blood of Jesus. Maybe you're not sure of your salvation this morning. To not be sure is to not be saved, friend. Maybe you come down this morning and say, God, forgive me, a sinner. God, I yield to you. God, I understand now that this world is fleeting. It's wood, it's hay, it's stubble. It's going to burn up. It's gone. God, I want something that's going to last. I want eternal life and I want eternal works. Lord, I yield myself to you. Maybe this morning you say, God, save me a sinner. I believe in Jesus by faith. Would you be saved this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you, we thank you, we praise your name, Lord. God, have your, your holy will and way this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand